Check it out, right? Charlie, take it home. Ground runway 24, taxi via Alpha. 24 via Alpha. I wonder if we could also pick up a tower and route clearance to Oceanside. We'll copy in the run up. Hey, Charlie, take it, Roger. Advise when you're ready. We'll advise. And podcast is sounding good these days. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Keep it up. It's a lot of work, I'm sure. Welcome, welcome back to Podcasting on a Plane. This is a view of aviation from both sides of the mic, where we give you straight talk about aviation from as many angles as we possibly can. My name is Brandon Gonzalez. I'm an air traffic controller at a busy General Aviation Airport on the West Coast, and I have an almost 25-year background in aviation as a controller, as a pilot, as a flight instructor, Part 141 Czech Airman. You, you know, whatever. You guys, you guys know the story. Anyway, we talk about aviation here from as many angles as we possibly can. And if there's a perspective I'm missing, the request lines are always open at podcastingonaplane.com slash contact. And while you're there, you can learn more about me and the guests we've had. You can listen to past episodes. You can record audio messages and feedback for the show. You can send an email. And you can learn how to become a valued supporter on Patreon. Did you see the Instagram post I made about the stuff Richard Collins' daughter sent me? It's incredible. For those of you new to the podcast, episode 20, it was a tribute to Dick Collins. And unfortunately, he passed away recently. But he was one of the greats of aviation media. And his countless articles made a huge difference in the way that I learned how to fly. And his daughter contacted me and sent in some really cool original film pictures, some of which might actually be older than me. And and they're really awesome. It's kind of like holding a small piece of aviation history. And if you're interested in seeing them, you can go follow the show on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And Sarah, if you're listening, thank you again so much for sending them. So last week, I had just an amazing day hanging out with a new friend. We went to a San Diego favorite, and we had a great time. True story. Oh, why do you care? Oh, right. Well, you probably know him, too. What do you think? You recognize his voice? Hello, everyone. I'm here in Southern California for a legal issue. And uh, it's kind of a, not a great reason to be out here in Southern California. But uh, my day got a lot better because after the events of this morning, I had a chance to meet up with uh, Brandon Gonzalez, the host of Podcasting on a Plane, aviation podcast. It's no surprise that Captain Jeff's a cool guy. Right. But what you might not know is that he's also a real audio guy, too. Now, when you listen to their podcast, you can tell that somebody's done their homework and it's him that does it. Now, he's he's in my neck of the woods for actually a pretty unpleasant legal thing. But after it was all wrapped up, he came down to San Diego and we decided to indulge our mutual love for craft beer at one of the meccas of craft brewing, which is the Stone Brewing Headquarters. They have an amazing restaurant and a really cool outdoor area. It's kind of like a beer garden, but they have ponds and chairs and it's it's amazing. So uh, while we enjoyed that. We also got to talking about microphones and audio production, and we got pretty deep into the weeds with it, actually, but in a good way. And as a matter of fact, we decided to get out the camera, and we filmed most of it. So for patrons of this show and patrons of his show, APG, look forward to that coming up soon. You can head over to patreon.com to become a patron of either one of the shows, or both, and uh, you're not going to want to miss it, or any of the other patron-only content you're going to find there. Anyway, it was a great day, and I can't wait to share it. Oh, and uh, I've, since I filmed it, of course, uh, vlog episode number four will be coming up on YouTube shortly, and it'll have sort of a reduced version of uh, what's on the Patreon site. Did you ever see The Langoliers? You know, the, the movie based on the Stephen King novel? Anyway, uh, okay, so I had a day recently where the airport seemed a little quiet, like weirdly quiet, right? And after I unplugged from my position, I went out on a break looking to see if I was the only one around. And I think that besides the other two controllers that were at the tower at the time, the airport was completely deserted. I mean, I went all over the place, but I didn't find another soul anywhere. And I've never seen anything quite like it. It It's really surreal, but I think Stephen King would be proud. But anyway, I made a little video about it. It's short and it's kind of fun. And it's on the YouTube channel right now. Make sure you go and subscribe. And there's a link in the show notes. And before we get to the news part of the show, I I think I'm going to start reading iTunes reviews on the show. What do you guys think? So if you want to have your iTunes review read, all you have to do is leave one. So here's a nice one from Saratoga 43 Tango. And they say, the first podcast was awesome and very personal. Anyone who survived an engine out will appreciate the first person account of a plane crash. Looking forward to more. Well, thanks. Yes, Saratoga 43 Tango. You know, the plane crash I survived was obviously something that uh, changed the course of my life. But I think more accurately, it, it more cemented the course that my career would take. 
And I, I think in a later episode, uh, I might dig a lot deeper into it and really tell the story of the events that led up to it. If you're all interested in that, don't drop me an email. And I, I know there aren't too many people out there that have survived an accident, but if you're out there in frequency land and you've had something happen to you like that, I would really love it if you contact me. It'd be cool to talk about, but, but more importantly, maybe we could share your story with everyone and either help somebody cope with, with something or better yet, just prevent somebody else from having a crash entirely. But if you're interested in hearing the story of my plane crash, go back all the way down to episode, the very first one, episode number one. So you probably noticed that the title of this episode involved both socializing and overhauling. And you figured out the socializing part by now, I bet. But let's get to the overhauling part. So no matter how you feel about aviation, these are really exciting times, right? A lot is changing. And while some of the change is polarizing, for example, ATC privatization, well, some things are probably universally good, though. For instance, Part 61. For those of you that don't know, Part 61 is has to do with the uh, certification of pilots and flight instructors and also maintaining their currency. So Part 61 of the Federal Aviation Regulations are what had an overhaul or at least a facelift. And some of the things are going to save students a bit of money and difficulty. But for now, it looks like the big winners are instrument pilots and sport pilots. And the other thing that's been getting overhauled is a little bit of the national airspace system as it pertains to instrument procedures. So to explain more, I'm going to read an article from Dan Namowitz at AOPA. The article is called, The FAA Releases a Policy for Eliminating Circling Approaches, June 28th, 2018. The FAA has released the policy it will use when selecting circling instrument approach procedures for cancellation as a transition of the national airspace system, sometimes we call it the NAS, to satellite-based navigation continues. The final policy takes effect July 30th and incorporates numerous recommendations produced by RTCA's Tactical Operations Committee, in which AOPA participated. The task group had studied the issue since 2015. Quote, as new technology has facilitated the introduction of area navigation, which is RNAV, instrument procedures over the past decade, the number of procedures available in the NAS has nearly doubled, the FAA said in the policy published June 28th. The complexity and cost to the FAA of maintaining the instrument flight procedures inventory while expanding the new RNAV capability is not sustainable. Managing two versions of the NAS requires excess manpower, infrastructure, and information management, which is costly and unsupportable in the long term. End quote. The FAA emphasized that the policy for eliminating circling approaches is not directly related to the creation of minimum operational network, a system of selected VORs that would be kept in operation as an emergency backup system to provide coverage during a GPS outage. The two initiatives are, quote, interwoven. However, the agency included wording addressing several issues AOPA urged to be considered to maintain pilots' access to training and for public awareness of the proposed circling approach cancellations. Circling approaches remain a requirement on some practical tests, and procedures allowing pilots to prepare for those exams should remain reasonably accessible in a given geographic area, AOPA said. Also, the FAA agreed with AOPA that the removal of individual circling approach procedures should be coordinated with the National Simulator Program to prevent adversely hindering simulator training and testing. The FAA also agreed to provide notification and a period for pilots to comment on proposed cancellations using the agency's Instrument Flight Procedures Information Gateway which is a centralized flight procedures data portal, to provide notifications. AOPA strongly recommends that all instrument pilots subscribe to the IFP gateway for notifications about procedure updates at the airports they use. And quick side note, I'll have a link for that in the show notes for you guys. Back to the article. AOPA believes the announced policy strikes a balance between the need to streamline the maintenance of the airspace system and to provide pilots with the means to train the latest certification standards, said Rune Duke, AOPA Senior Director of Airspace and Air Traffic. Quote, this final policy is a good example of how a close collaboration between industry and the FAA can have a positive effect on progress toward our shared goal of a next-gen airspace system, he said. The FAA's criteria identify redundant procedures for cancellation while still ensuring local pilots have an opportunity to comment before a final decision is made. We encourage pilots to utilize the IFP gateway and provide feedback to the FAA as they continue their transition to a predominantly satellite-based navigation system, end quote. And again, that article by Dan Nemowitz, AOPA, he's the associate uh, web editor. The other big overhaul happening has to do with Part 61. It's more of a facelift, really, if you ask me, but it should save some money for a lot of instrument-rated pilots when it comes to maintaining proficiency, and sport pilots are getting some real benefits, too. The article is titled, FAA Cuts Cost of Training. Proficiency Instrument and Sport Pilots are the Big Beneficiaries. This article is from June 27th by Jim Moore at AOPA. 
The FAA on June 27th published a final rule that will allow broader use of technology to reduce the cost of flight training and maintaining proficiency without compromising safety. For years, AOPA has sought and supported these regulatory changes that are expected to save the general aviation community more than $110 million in the next five years. The article continues, The most significant changes to pilot certification regulations in many years will reduce the cost of training and proficiency by tens of millions of dollars per year. AOPA has made it a priority to ease the financial burden on students and certificated pilots, and many of the changes made by the FAA that are incorporated in the final version were requested by AOPA and other aviation groups. The FAA's final rule includes many changes, particularly to Part 61, that were originally published in a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, NPRM, in 2016. The Part 61 overhaul will take effect July 27th, with all changes implemented by December 24th, and will reduce costs to pilots in large part by leveraging advances in avionics, aircraft equipment, flight simulators, and aviation training devices. The new regulations recognize the effectiveness of modern technology and ease past restrictions on its use to further reduce the cost of flight training, as well as proficiency maintenance. They're also crafted to give the FAA more flexibility to approve the use of advanced avionics technologies that are still to come. The FAA estimates that pilots and operators will save up to $113.5 million over five years, and those are in 2016 dollars, with the most significant savings to come from allowing instrument-rated pilots who use advanced aviation training devices, ATDs, to satisfy flight experience requirements to enjoy six months of currency rather than two. That part of the Part 61 overhaul takes effect November 26. The extended currency interval will also allow instrument-rated pilots to use any combination of aircraft and ATD to accomplish the flight experience required for currency. The FAA estimates that these changes to 6157C alone will save pilots $76.1 million over five years. Allowing sport pilots to credit their flight experience toward higher certificates and ratings will increase the value of sport pilot training and save pilots an estimated $14 million over five years, eliminating the requirement for an instructor to be present while instrument-rated pilots use flight simulators and ATDs to satisfy currency requirements is estimated to save the instrument pilot population another $12.5 million over five years. In April, the FAA discontinued the requirement that commercial pilots and flight instructor candidates conduct their single-engine airplane practical test in a complex airplane, and the final rule published June 27th takes that step further. As of June 27th, commercial pilot candidates can use, quote, technically advanced airplanes, end quote, in lieu of or in combination with a complex or turbine-powered airplane to satisfy the 10 hours of required training in these airplanes. This is estimated to save trainees $2.8 million over the next five years. Quote, making aviation less costly is fundamental to AOPA's mission, which is why we pursued these changes that will save the general aviation community more than $100 million over the next five years alone to help make pursuing and advancing a pilot certificate more accessible to everyone, said AOPA President Mark Baker. The FAA responding to industry comments on the NPRM also adjusted the definition of, quote, technically advanced airplane, end quote, to be broader and more general, adding language to Part 61-129 to allow the FAA to authorize use of aircraft that may not meet the requirements as presently written. Quote, this additional language is intended to provide flexibility by allowing the FAA to accommodate future technologies that do not necessarily meet the confines of regulatory requirements for a technically advanced aircraft in 61-129J, end quote, the FAA wrote in the final rule. Another of the many changes detailed in the lengthy final rule will allow sport pilot instructors with a required endorsement to provide training on control maneuvering solely by reference to instruments. While the FAA estimates a minimal cost saving to students, the change will nonetheless increase the value of the sport pilot instructor certificate and benefit flight schools that offer sport pilot training, as well as instructors and students. The AOPA Director of Regulatory Affairs, Justin Barkowski, led the association's effort to analyze and respond to the NPRM that preceded the final rule. Among the points successfully pushed, the pilots will be allowed to use a combination of complex, turbine-powered, and technically advanced airplanes to satisfy the 10-hour commercial pilot training requirement, instead of having to choose one of the three. Sport pilot instructors will be allowed to receive the required flight training hours in an ATD in order to obtain the endorsement required to teach instrument skills. Barkowski said he expects the final rule to prompt discussion of what exactly a technically advanced aircraft is, and noted that the FAA drafted the final rule to accommodate advances in technology. Quote, generally speaking, aircraft equipped with an electronic flight display, PFD, and a multifunction display, MFD, as well as a two-axis autopilot would qualify as a TAA, Barkowski noted. The language in the final rule gives FAA discretion to approve other types of TAA in the future without further rulemaking, but we encourage everyone to check the definition to see if your aircraft qualifies first, end quote. AOPA also asked the FAA to allow pilots to obtain a temporary document online to confirm medical certification. The FAA determined this particular change is outside the scope of the rulemaking, though the agency noted that a system is being created 
which is called the Aerospace Medicine Safety Information System, by the way, and scheduled for implementation in 2020 to accomplish that goal. Now, there's a table of the regulatory changes that are coming and when they go into effect, and I'll put that, of course, in the show notes. But that article, again, was from Jim Moore, again, at uh, AOPA. So what do you all think about this? I mean, is this going to benefit you? Leave me a comment on social media or send me an audio message or an email. I'm really curious to hear what you all think. Now, it might save a couple of bucks, but to me, the larger point is that the FAA is really listening to industry and making some logical changes in order to cut down on the astronomical and rising cost of becoming a pilot. And this, of course, comes as welcome news uh, to most flight school owners that I know have been spending incredible sums of money, large sums of money, maintaining aging complex aircraft in their training fleets. I mean, anybody who's ever owned an old Aero or, or a Mooney, well, they know what a money pit they can be, and especially in a high utilization environment like a flight school. I mean, typical flight schools only have one or maybe a couple of these airplanes around. So if it or one of them breaks or just even needs some routine maintenance, well, the problem doesn't just stop there with the cost of that maintenance. The lost revenue and scheduling frustration is felt on both sides of the fence with both the school and the poor commercial or CFI student losing out. And here we are at my favorite part of the show, and that's where we talk about training. And I thought today we'd follow up with Ben from last time about how his learning plateau is coming along. You probably remember from the last episode that we had Ben and he had a little bit of difficulty figuring out those last couple of feet before touchdown. And he was getting really frustrated. He emailed me for some help. And he says, now, after the last episode, I don't know if it was a fluke or as my CFI stated, she thinks I'm just starting to awaken. But my feet were working more in conjunction with my brain and hands. And I'm hoping for the latter. I'm starting to think she was right all along. I was just too tense. I was trying too hard. You see, I'm somewhat of a perfectionist in life. And while this is really great for flight planning and pre-trip inspections and things like that, ground school, the physics of flight, whatever, it's not really a good thing for pure airmanship. I was trying to force the plane and I wanted so badly to get that great landing every time that I was just trying too hard. This resulted in very poor landings every time. Airmanship is kind of an artsy thing in my humble opinion. It takes touch. It's like riding a horse. A good rider can get more out of a horse by coaxing and working with the horse and by knowing his limitation rather than forcing and spurring. And when you're riding a horse, are you really the one ultimately in charge? I think it's a lot like the mother nature pilot relationship. Who's really in charge? And can I work with it to get a safe result? A good pilot probably knows the same thing. Or at the very least, that's what I'm starting to think. You see, I'm a numbers guy. I like things in order, nice and tidy. And some aviation things are like that. I'm pretty convinced now that pilotage is not one of them. I need to learn when to push and when to go with it. And that's really hard for me. It's hard to let go of my old ways and trust my CFI when she tells me I have to work with what I've got. Fly it. Stop trying to force it. Got it. Wow. You know, I really wanted to read this letter to you guys because I don't think I could have said that any better myself. Ben, I think you might also have a way with words, but I think you summed it up perfectly. He added a little PS part at the end and he finishes up by saying, thanks for being there and listening. I'll keep you posted on my progress or regress whichever the case may be. But you just letting me know that I'm not a rare case of ineptness and that lots of people go through what I did helped me immensely. For that and just being there for the aviation community on so many levels, I thank you. Well, Ben, you are welcome. And, you know, that's a great deal of why I do this. A lot of people don't realize how grueling flight training can actually be. And often when an individual without a strong drive to succeed comes up on a learning plateau or a struggle, they kind of just throw in the towel. And usually it's right before they would have probably had that all-important breakthrough. Personally, I think this has a lot to do with why the completion ratio of starters to finishers and pilot training is so low. And we've talked about that before on this podcast. And it also sounds like Ben CFI is doing a really great job of coaching him through this. So Ben, I'm really glad to hear of your success and thank you so much for sharing it with all of us. And if you're a listener of this show and you have a story like this or something you'd like to share, well, don't hold it in. You can share by going to podcastionaplane.com slash contact and you can record a message or send me an email or a tweet. On Twitter, I'm at podcast on a plane, and on all the rest of social media, it's podcasting on a plane. And if you're interested in doing a live one-on-one -on -one mentoring session with me, I'm available to help you in your development as an aviation professional. So on that note, I've got to run because I have to go to the airport right now to endorse one of my guys to become a new multi-engine instructor. Don't worry, more on that next time. So that's all for now. Frequency changes approved till next time and report back on this frequency for the next episode. Good day.
Podcasting on a Plane podcast is presented for entertainment purposes only. My comments and those of my guests, the website's content, and any of the social media, etc., are not part of my official responsibility as a controller or an FAA employee. The views and opinions you hear on the podcast are mine and those of my guests, and not necessarily that of the FAA. There is no nexus between podcasting on a plane and the FAA. Also, while I am a CFI, I'm not your CFI. Nor am I your mechanic, your doctor, your shrink, or your spouse. This podcast is presented for entertainment, camaraderie, and fun, but is in no way, shape, or form professional advice. It's not legal counsel, and it's definitely not flight instruction. If you are in need of professional advice, get some from somewhere more appropriate than a podcast, no matter how good this one may be. What do you think? Should we go back to these uh, IPAs? Yes. All right. Out. <laughs>